earth to God Come in God I know you're there Hearing our prayers wherever you are We need you now To send your love down Take away the pain in your holy name We ask this now We need your light We need your love To heal the world you made And save us now In our darkest hour With your amazing grace Earth to God We're holding on But not for long all close to the Holy Ghost and keep us strong. We need your light, we need your love to heal the world you made and save us now in our darkest hour with your amazing grace. Earth to God. I've been one 
blood No longer the man that I once was When you look at me Make a like what you see But I'm a child of the King Oh, I'm a child of the King I've been washed by the blood No longer the man that I once was When you look at me You may not like what you see But I'm a child of the King If this is your first time here, I want to say welcome, and we are honored uh, and glad to have you here. And so if you would, if you can just do us just a little small favor, if you could just lift your hand up, and on, in your, we're going to hand you a card, and on that card, we want just a little bit of information from you. And then as you're heading out the door on the left-hand side, we got a welcome booth, uh, and then there's some bags sitting on top of that welcome booth, and there's some ladies sitting behind that welcome booth. You can just give your card to those ladies, and they're going to give you that bag. And there's a lot of information about the church. There's some cookies in there. And we are thankful that you are here. We are honored to have you here. Okay, so here's what we got going. So next uh, week, uh, we have a going away celebration uh, for Dell and Mitzi. And so uh, as you're going out the door, uh, right in the middle of the foyer there, there's a, a picture frame. And in the middle of that picture frame, there's going to be a picture. But what we're wanting to do is just uh, as small as you can, just sign your name on that picture frame. We're going to give that to them. Uh, next Sunday as kind of a recognition, and we're going to honor them next Sunday. But tonight at 6 p.m., we got our connections group. And what that is is either you're fixing to get married or you are married. And so it's just a good time to come together. It's going to be in the West Room at 6 p.m. Next Sunday, we have an arena team meeting. It's going to be right after church uh, in the old sanctuary. It's going to be about 10 or 15 minutes. We're going to keep it short. And you all keep your eyes out. Uh, for a new Sunday school class that's coming. It's going to be the Bible basics for new believers. And so if you just want to learn more, uh, if you're just a new believer, uh, it's a new Sunday school class. The location is to be determined, but we're going to have it. Uh, tomorrow, e no, excuse me, next Monday, February the 8th, we've got a cultural impact meeting. So you had your flyer that was in your bulletin, so you all read over that. Mike Garcia, yeah, he's going to be here, so this is a flyer. You all take a look at that. And then get ready, because uh, February 19th through 21st, we got Trey Johnson coming back, and he's doing a revival. And every night, he's going to be preaching here. And so it's just going to be an old-timey revival, and it, except for it's going to be on fire, because that brother can preach. So it's going to be awesome. And then uh, this week, we're going to be roping. And so we'll start roping the dummy at 530. And then uh, kitchen opens up at 6. Our service starts at 645. And so be sure to be here for that. So if we would, y'all pray with me. Lord, I thank you for this day, and I thank you, God, for who you are. God, I thank you for your mercy and your grace. And Lord, I thank you for what we get to do here uh, every single Sunday. And Lord, I pray that you would be in this place. God, I pray that you would speak through uh, Mr. Reaver. God, I pray that you would use him in such a mighty and powerful way to bring you glory and honor and praise. And Lord, may everything that we do honor and glorify your name. And Lord, we love you. Amen. Living below in this old sinful world Hardly a comfort can afford Striving along to face temptation so Where could I go but to the Lord? Soul. Needing a friend to 
save me in the end? Where could I go but to the Lord? Neighbors are kind, I love them everyone. We get along in sweet accord. But when my soul needs manna from above, seated here in just a second we've got a very special guest that's going to be with us today brother Dave Reaver uh, and at the end of the service we're going to take up a love offering for Dave and his foundation there's uh, he has a product table out there in the foyer so stop by there he's got books and I believe CDs all kinds of material stop by there and uh, I'm sure that you can find something that you'd like to look at or read and, uh, but at no farther on, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Brother Dave Reaver. He's going to come up at this time, and I'm going to help him come on up here. Okay. Good morning. <laughs> Took me a while to get here. <laughs> took longer to drive to walk up here than it did drive <laughs> you guys I can't get over your music do you realize what you got here wow it's not like some churches we go to they get up and say y'all pray for us while we try to sing they start trying to sing and I start praying and that is a true story I mean some of it's so bad uh, I love when people are, do this for the Lord with excellence. Amen? Great to be back in Athens. You guys, I love you, and I'm so happy to be back. It's my pleasure and my honor to be in this church with you. And look at you. You guys, someone didn't tell you. There, there's, the world's depressed. Did they, didn't you know that? Well, boy, you don't sound it. You're right on top of what God's doing, and I want to tell you, you are a beacon of hope in Athens in this part, this whole region. I'm just, I can't say enough what it means to me to be here with you. 
Uh, I don't travel alone. I travel with Dave and Kathy Wampler. She's been my associate evangelist for decades. Actually, we uh, ministered together for over 30 years. And uh, I've asked her to come and her husband uh, to be with us today. She's very soon to be uh, totally on her own, with, uh, of course, with her husband. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing that her ministry expands way beyond what she's able to do for me. But I know my sunset's coming. I was reminded of it yesterday when we buried my brother-in-law. It was a very, very sad day yesterday. Uh, I feel like the Communist Party in China murdered him. And I'm just being honest because he lost his life way too early. And as he was put in the ground, I thought, you know, there's a better day coming. And if it, was, if it wasn't for hope in Christ Jesus, we'd all be miserable, wouldn't we? And it's not in this life only, it's in the world to come. And that, my friend, is going to be one amazing ride. I, I, I well, started saying, I can't wait, but I think I will. <laughs> I don't want to rush things here. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die to get there. So, uh, Kathy, come on up here. I'm going to ask her to greet you and say a few words of encouragement to you, and then I've asked her to sing one of the great songs of the church, an anthem of the church. I'll let her announce it, but when you hear it, you'll understand. Would you welcome Reverend Kathy Wampler? Thank you. Thank you. It's an honor to be with you this morning. I uh, Recently, we were driving through Colorado, actually on motorcycles, going through a beautiful part of the state, and on the side of the road, there was a sign on the highway that said, prison area, do not pick up hitchhikers. Have you seen one of those signs before when you drive? Well, I got to be honest. When I see those signs, I think to myself, you know what? I don't need a sign for that. I don't know about you. I, I'm personally not in the habit of picking up hitchhikers. That's not kind of something I do. And as a matter of fact, the one time I did pick up a hitchhiker, when he got in the car, he asked me if I was worried he was a serial killer. To which I replied, it's highly unlikely there's two in the same car at the same time. <laughs> so we just settled that right there. No, that didn't happen. That's a joke. That didn't happen. I, but but when, I, when I pass by this sign on the side of the road, I, I think to myself, you know, I would never do it. Because when you pick up a hitchhiker, now I'm responsible for this person who's obviously a criminal who escaped from prison. And now I'm responsible for him. I'm going to have to feed him. I might have to give him a place to sleep. I mean, the story could go down the road a million miles that just doesn't turn out. It doesn't end well for me, you know. And so I passed by the sign, and I kind of chuckled. I was just killing time in my head. And then I got to thinking for just a minute. How many times in my life have I picked up spiritual hitchhikers? Passing through an area of my life, and I might even have seen some warning signs, and I picked up things like fear, depression, anger, suicidal thoughts, loss of hope, do I need to keep going? You know, the list goes on and on and on of these spiritual hitchhikers that we pick up and we give them a free ride and then we feed them because we watch the news and we listen to everybody's opinions and we see everything that's going on. We feed them. We give them a place to lodge in our heart. And guess what? The end of this story does not end well for me. <laughs> it won't end well for you if you don't take those little hitchhikers and bring them back to prison where they belong. The Bible tells us to do it. The Bible tells us to take our thoughts captive and bring them into the obedience of Christ. So here's the rule. If it lines up, if you compare it to Jesus and it doesn't line up with him, it's a hitchhiker. Throw it back. Throw it back. Catch and release, I guess, if you're fishing. Throw it back. If it doesn't line up with the word of God, it doesn't line up with Jesus and who he says he is. Amen? Because here's the thing, church. When we know Jesus and we love Jesus and we've got our eyes on Jesus, no matter what you see, all this stuff we saw in that video that opened, all those scenes of destruction and devastation, when I know Jesus, no matter what happens to me, I can say, it is well with my soul. Is it well with your soul today? It is well with my soul. Amen. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when 
sorrow like sea billows roll Whatever my lot Thou hast taught me to say It is well, it is well with my soul My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole. It is nailed to the cross and with my soul it is well it is well with my soul and Lord the day when my faith shall be sight the clouds be rolled back as a scroll and then the trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend With my soul, it is well, it is well with my soul, it is well, it is well with my Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> Amen. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. God bless you, folks. You know when music's good. You just showed that. I, this is a church that if you don't have good music, don't put them on stage. I'll tell you that. Come up here with me, Kathy. Uh, she has uh, two minutes of business right quick. She has three albums back there if you enjoy the spirit that you feel right now following that song, that's a, that's, she has three albums full of that same attitude and spirit. Also available on DVD is my entire story in a very comprehensive way put together out of a small church there in Dallas-Fort Worth called Gateway. And if you know who I'm talking about. But they did a great job editing it. It's a beautiful DVD. You'll love it. And then a couple of books that I've written and have not colored in yet. <laughs> that, that was a joke. <laughs> This is an autobiography called Scarred. It is my personal story beginning in my childhood and tracing through all the incidents in my life where the devil's really tried to kill me. I can tell you, you'll understand more before I'm through today. And that book will encourage you. And at the end, if you want to share that with somebody that doesn't know Christ, it, it, it helps lead them to know Christ. Also, my most recent book called War and Recovery. And it's a compilation of short stories that have been brought off the battlefield in Iraq. And I'll tell you why I was there. Uh, what God did, 
But this book is short stories. To I wrote it for you, civilians, for this reason. I don't want you thinking you have to go to war to get hurt. I went to war and got hurt and came home with a purple heart. Some of you went to, well, thank you. Some of you went to divorce court and came home with a broken heart and a broken washer. And the ex got the dryer and it worked. That book is about life's not fair, my friend, but God is just. And that's what makes them. So those books, we have a shirt with our initials of our operation, Warrior Reconnect on it, our beautiful logo on the back. We are a Department of Defense registered program. And the right shoulder has the forward moving flag. The stars lead the stripes, which means we're advancing, not retreating. And I don't care who's in the White House. I don't care who's in the outhouse. We are advancing in the kingdom of God. Amen. Come on. Yes, indeed. Now, I want to explain to you that I'm not as frail as it looks like. Uh, I'm 74, but I'm going on 50, and 50 is the new 30, and if you're into Common Core, Common Core Math, you can be, I'm 21. <laughs> but I do want to tell you why I have to sit down. Since I last saw you, uh, some of you know that, if you remember, it's been quite a while. Uh, I was injured in Iraq when I jumped out of a helicopter, and my, I hit wrong. My feet went out from under me, and I hit the ground so hard. Just that fast, I shattered six vertebrae. And uh, hospitalized, they put in 12 screws and two rods. Now I'm an inch taller. I don't know how that worked. I guess they stretch you out and cinch you down, and there you are. Uh, but I hit so hard, I was on braces for a couple of years. And one day I decided I was just going to take them off and walk in the name of Jesus. I took my first step and fell right on my face. Well, I didn't work, so I waited a month and tried again. Second time, same results, hit the deck face first. It just wasn't going to work. But then... If you don't quit, you still believe. The breakthrough came on the third try. wasn't a charm. It was a gift from God. I took my first step, second, third, fourth, and I learned to walk again. But steps frightened me a little bit, and I can't stand for a long time. So I apologize I sat through worship, but I wanted to be able to give you my best this morning. So if that explains it, I hope so. Uh, but my injury that put me down the hardest was in Vietnam. And I'll get to that in a moment because some of you know that story, but the consequences of since have been spectacular. And what's happened in the last three and four years is even more. Some of you knew me, uh, knew I didn't have a nose. I only had this piece of it. But three years ago, they made me a nose. It's a boy. <laughs> I have a nose. I got my eyelids back, and they corrected my mouth, got my lips back. And released my neck because it had pulled down. And operation number 50, when they got through, with it was 12 hours and nine doctors. They actually uh, offered me a full face transplant. And then I saw the guy's face. I said, no. <laughs> He's uglier than me without a hand grenade explosion. I tell you, he was really ugly. When he was born, the doctor slapped his mother. <laughs> that, that ain't ugly. That's ugly. So uh, I've had 60 surgeries since my original injury in Vietnam, and they're still trying to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. They never will finish. But one day, when the horses men and the horses themselves can't do it, the king comes along. And on resurrection morning, you'll see a new Dave. And... Uh, I'm not emotional, I'm allergic to this carpet, and <laughs> waters me up every time I speak, I, I end up with bad carpet. But I just want you to know that I still believe in the resurrection. I do, more than ever. I believe Jesus is coming back again. Do you believe that? Yes. <laughs> and all the signs, how can we miss the signs today? Oh my word, from Every sign of the return of Christ prophesied biblically has, has been accomplished. And so all, the only thing left is the sound of a trumpet. Amen. Amen. And the dead in Christ rise first because they get a six-foot head start. <laughs> and then we get to go up with them. So uh, actually, I've believed it as far back as I can remember. Some people have been raised like me in the household of faith. 
they don't even remember the day they were born again because it was so at such an early date. But I do remember when I was five years old, I gave my heart to Christ. Five years old. Now, I got to admit, I didn't know what it meant, but I remember praying that prayer, and I was picking corrugated rubber off the bottom step of my high chair and repeating a little prayer for Jesus to come into my heart. I remember that. And if you can remember that, something drastic happened inside you. But 11 years later, at the age of 16, I figured it out what that really meant to be born again. And at 16, to sit on this stage, on this chair today, I've never walked back on that faith. And I want you to, I want you to know, I believe that when you give your heart to Christ and you totally commit to him, the Bible says nothing can pluck you out of the hand of God. Now, you can jump if you want, but that's kind of stupid. Don't, don't jump out of the hand of God. But nothing can take away your faith. If you hang in there, it, the reward is amazing. Even when you die, then you hear, well done, thou good and faithful. You don't hear that till you die. You've got to be faithful unto death. And it kind of worried me anyway, thinking that Jesus would tell me I was well done. When I've been burned, it's medium. <laughs> You don't want to be well done. That was stupid. <laughs> I think I'll leave that one out next time. <laughs> but I grew up in the church. And my, when I was born, my mom almost died. And uh, she never did recover. Decades later, she passed away in a nursing home with her body weighing 70, uh, 68 pounds. And uh, she couldn't speak, hear, see. We don't know. It was horrible. Fed through a feeding tube. And when I was born, she couldn't take care of me. She couldn't even feed me. So I had a Mexican nanny, Maria Rubio. She taught me how to roll my R's. I learned how to speak Spanish before I learned how to speak English. I was six years old when they told me I had to learn English to go to school. I was six years old when they told me I was not a Mexican. <laughs> you know what that does to your Hispanic brain? <laughs> to discover you're not what you thought you were. I'm going to tell you something. You cannot come to Christ without discovering that moment of self-discovery that we're not really what we thought we were. I remember Simon Peter and, of course, James and John, they were all in the garden and there to pray. And Jesus said, watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. And Peter piped out, hey, hey, wait, Jesus, it's me. It's me. Come on, Peter. 1-800-P-E-T-E-R, you need prayer? I, you, I'm the prayer guy. Went sound asleep. Remember that? And Jesus said, wake up, guys. You know, lest you enter into temptation. Not me, he said, at the crow of a rooster and the job of a servant girl, you're going to turn your back on me. Oh, no, not me, Jesus. Well, at the crow of a rooster and the job of a servant girl, Peter cursed Jesus. You ever talk about somebody and they walk up on you? <laughs> Peter was standing there talking negatively about Jesus, looked over there, Jesus standing right there. Oh, my word. He felt like an idiot. You know, and he went over, and the Bible says he sat down on the porch and put his chin in his hands as well. I can see it. Tears running down, dripping through his fingers. When he discovered he wasn't what he thought he was. And you know, we have a pretty high opinion of ourselves when the flesh is in charge. When the spirit takes over. When we accept Jesus Christ into us and then we're baptized into the Holy Spirit and the Holy Ghost comes upon us. I'm going to tell you, it changes your whole view of everything. Everything has changed. And all of a sudden you realize, without Christ, I'm not going to make it. Without the power of the Holy Spirit, especially in days like we live in now, we're not going to make it. We need all of God we can get. And that song we sang at the beginning said so. And I believe it. And so now at the age of 74, uh, since 2001, uh, two weeks after 9-11, I was called by the Department of Defense. And uh, I was made a defense contractor. And I've been a defense contractor to this day. And my tours have taken me multiple times, six to Iraq, two to Afghanistan, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Oman, Qatar, UAE, Syria, Bosnia, Kosovo, North Africa, South Korea, uh, Japan, Okinawa. I can go on all the countries they send me to to minister. Now listen to me, to minister and share my story with the troops. And they don't discourage me to talk about my faith because in the Comprehensive Soldier Fitness Program, and if you've... Been a, if you're a vet of the Global War on Terror, you know what that is. That is a resiliency training course, and I'm a master resiliency trainer in that course, and I train commanders to train their underlings how to help their warriors look into that dark, uh, stop looking into that darkness that's killing them. And, you know, you can look into the darkness long enough, it starts looking back into you. And that's when suicides skyrocket. 
And COVID has done that to a lot of guys, especially in our military who were stuck overseas and can't come home because of importing, they think, some kind of strange virus into their communities. Well, I made that decision to follow Christ at 16. There's a scripture in Philippians, if you want to look at it, it's real simple, but it's Philippians 1, 12, where Paul was in prison. He's not having a good day, right? He's having a really tough day. He writes, the things which happened to me, he, he actually addressed it to the brethren. He said, brethren, I would you should know. So the letter is written to the church in Philippi, not the Philippines. It says, I want you to know that the things that happened to me, God's exchanged them for the preaching of the gospel. And I thought about that scripture one day, and I thought, my goodness, that, that, that speaks for me. The thing that happened to me in Vietnam, the devil intended for evil. He tried to kill me that day. I, and I'm going to tell you, he tried lots of times to kill me. I mentioned that earlier. How many times have you flown through a stop sign you didn't see and just barely missed, or somebody else flew through the stop sign just barely missed hitting you, and you get all those little needles it feels like go through your whole body as your body reacts to that sudden rush of adrenaline that you almost got killed. Every hand would go up in this room, and I'm going to tell you why you're still here, because God's not through with either one of us. He's got a plan for your life and a plan for my life, and the greatest experience in life is fulfilling that plan, and you talk about an adventure. Oh, serving God's not a job. It's an adventure. Even the Army can't keep up with that one. And so uh, my earliest years, I learned that being changed is not bad, especially when you're a baby. <laughs> being changed is really good. Good for the baby. <laughs> My son was born. We lived in an 18-foot travel trailer, and we were preaching all over the country, living in an 18-foot travel trailer. He was born. He took up 22 feet of it. <laughs> I mean, when she changed that boy's diaper, I had to go outside. I could sack up dead bodies in Vietnam, zip up the bag, and send them home and never throw up. When he filled that 25-pound diaper with 26 pounds, <laughs> I was out the door throwing up, gagging, vomiting. I'm not kidding you. I couldn't. And then one day she was gone to pick up some more Gerber's, and he did it. Oh, Lord, it was horrible. I just picked him up by the foot and walked backwards so I didn't have to smell it. And I'm walking out, and I get out in the yard, and I lay him down. I just turned the water hose on him. And she pulled up. <laughs> she was in the driveway. She beat me severely. She said, he's blue. I said, well, he's a Smurf. <laughs> that was the last time she asked me to change the diaper. It worked, guys. Don't forget but we started out, uh, my, my little wife and I, in ministry after my injury in Vietnam. I was 16 years old when I met her and I asked her to marry me. And she was 13 years old. She said, I'm only 13. I said, but you have the body of a 14-year-old. <laughs> she slapped me. She did. Pretty good right hook, too. And she said, if you love me. And boy, that word, if, is the whole world hangs on the word if, you know. <laughs> If you, I said, she said, you wait for me. I said, I'll, wait. I'll pick you up at 10. But I knew what she meant. And we waited. So for all the young people in the house, I just want you to know, here we were young. We did not have sex till we were married. And uh, thank you. Some people find that awkward in church. If we don't tell them who is. You want some teacher at school tell them, well, if you take a little cocaine with sex, it's, uh, and that's what they teach them in Boulder, Colorado, in the public schools. You know, we, if, if someone said it best, I wish I knew who, I'd give them credit. If you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. And you got to stand, folks. You got, especially today when children are so confused and this darkness is sweeping over them, they're locked in their house, they can't go to school, so many of them, and, Boy, it's good to be in Athens where I, this is the first place I felt normality in this pandemic. I'm not kidding you. I feel like you guys are finally, I got around some people that are normal. Normal. And so we got married and uh, I, I was in Bible college and I wasn't doing real good in Bible college. I was working at General Dynamics. We were building an airplane called the F-111. It was a sweep wing fighter bomber, first of its kind very effective in war, and they wanted to get it produced quickly so they could test it out in wartime in Vietnam. And so I was working there, and I was making so much money, I paid my school bill off in 30 days. Bought a new car, had everything I wanted, my little sweet wife and I going to college. And all of a sudden, my life would change again. Oh, my post office box, there's a letter from a very, very rich uncle I have. 
And he just insisted I come visit. Uh, I was being drafted and told me to go take my fiscal. I wrote him back and said, thanks for your inquiry into my health, but I really feel great. But he insisted I take that fiscal, and I did. And it was the only exam I passed that semester of college. If you didn't catch that, don't worry about it. I'll just put it this way. My, glow, my, my grades were below sea level. <laughs> if you didn't catch that, it's because you live in Athens. You're a long ways from the Gulf. Uh, and so they told me I was going to be inducted in the Army, and I didn't show up the next morning. I, didn't, I wasn't a draft dodger. I just didn't want to go in the Army. If I'm going to serve my country, I want to go in the Navy because I love the water and I'd love being on a ship, but not ground pounding somewhere in a rice paddy in Vietnam. So I joined the Navy, which is a four-year commitment. If you're drafted, it's only a two-year commitment. I said, I'll double my tour of duty just to get to do what I want to do. So I joined the Navy. My second day in boot camp, they made me a ground pounder. <laughs> Never been on a ship. Yeah, I was in boot camp. They said, you went to college? I said, yes, sir. I was in Bible college. He said, you're the only one here who went to college. I said, well, I don't know what to tell him. Well, I'm really sad about that. Or I didn't know what to say. I said, well, okay. No, no, he said, your leadership material. I was below sea level. I thought, we're going to lose this war. <laughs> That's exactly what I thought. I went through boot camp, and they told me I was going to go to Vietnam, so I ended up in training in a place called Naval Amphibious Base, Coronado, California, the headquarters for the Special Warfare Command of the U.S. Navy, Special Operators, U.S. Navy SEALs, the special dive vehicle teams, they little one and two man submarines, and the brown water black beret. And that just sounded cool to me. I said, well, if I'm gonna serve in special ops, I wanna be a brown water black beret, because I love the water, and they put me on a real fast fiberglass riverboat that scoot them down those rivers like crazy, with a forward gunner, an aft gunner, and a midship gunner. So there were four of us on a boat, the driver and three gunners. One was a M60 in the middle, and in the front was a 50 caliber, and in the 250 calibers, and in the back was 150 caliber. We were a fort looking for a fight. I mean, the enemy was terrified of us because we were very effective. And I drove for SEAL Team 1. I was not a SEAL, I was a brown water black brain. Now we're called special boat teams. We're symbiotically attached to the Navy SEALs. But we were a brand new unit, very small, and we had the highest killed in action in the entire war, per capita. We had the highest. So when I kissed my little teenage wife goodbye to go to Vietnam, I knew the odds were I would not see her again. With the highest killed in action, but you can't prove it because if the body goes down with the boat, everybody's body went down with the boat. And if you get hit and you're killed and they don't have a body, you're not killed in action, though they know you're dead. Until they have your body, your MIA, missing in action. So when I say I was, we, were, we had the highest killed in action, that's a fact, but you can't prove it. And when I kissed her goodbye, I thought that'd be the last time I'd taste the salt of those tears on her face ever again. And I still remember what it tastes like. I got about five steps really proud of myself, not a tear. And on about the fifth step, she called me by my name of endearment. She said, Davey. And I stopped, and before I could turn around, tears burst over the dam of all my resistance. My lower lids could not restrain the tears. And I was so mad at myself. And I looked at her, and I yelled, what? <laughs> it like it was her fault. And she asked me a question that haunts me on every tour I do, all the tours to all the countries I mentioned. Every time I leave to go overseas, she asked me the same question, Davey, are you coming back? And I said, I'll be back without a scar. Why did I say that? <laughs> I could have just said, I'll be back. Then I could be governor of California. <laughs> I'll be back without a scar. Boy, when I said it, I felt a chill up my spine. Oh, my word, I just made a promise I cannot keep. When I walked away that time, I honestly thought it was the last time I'd ever see her. Ended up in Vietnam, and I was there for eight months. And on the eighth month, I took two injuries three days apart. On the 23rd of July, without a scratch all those months, and firefights every week, sometimes two or three even in one day. It, we were regularly attacked. We were, we were the last line of defense 
for the Vietnamese people to exercise their commerce by using those rivers, and the communists wanted to control those rivers. We were under attack constantly for eight months. Not a scratch. Two injuries three days apart, and the second one blew me out of the water, we'll call it. The first one was relatively minor, but it kept me off the river for three days. And on the third day I went back, and it put me out of the water for the rest of my life. I was picked up a white phosphorus hand grenade. It burns at white hot. It burns at 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And I pulled the pin. I drew back to throw the microphone would be the grenade. I was in this position, and a sniper across the river took his best shot, shooting in my head. He missed and hit my hand, and the bullet went right through between my thumb and index finger, and it exploded right here. White phosphorus burns at 5,000 degrees, I've been told. I didn't have a thermometer that day. But I do know this, you can't extinguish it. It has to burn itself out. Water will not extinguish it. I actually jumped in the water and I burned in the water just exactly the way I was burning out of the water. And when I inhaled, I sucked that flame right down into my bronchial tubes and I was underwater. When I came up, I exhaled that fire out of my mouth and I made this as my very first statement. God! And when I did, a ball of fire came out. Boy, I wish I could do that again without the pain. God, I still believe in you. <laughs> he knew that. Why did I tell him? I knew that, so why did I say it? It wasn't for God or me. I said it for the boys that I've been witnessing to for eight months. I didn't want them thinking, God did this to me. God doesn't hurt us. God didn't shoot me that day. He didn't set me on fire that day. This is war, my friend. So a lot of things happen, and we shake our feet. Why me? God, don't. Do that. What if he answered you? Well, I don't know, George. There's just something about you I don't like. <laughs> God does not do evil. Say that out loud with me. God does not do evil. God didn't come up with COVID. The communist Chinese did that. You know, I, I don't blame God for COVID. As a matter of fact, I haven't found a negative thing yet to blame God with. I just can't find it. Not that I'm running around looking for it, but I... Just can't find it. So God didn't shoot me the day. He didn't hurt me that day. And when I said, God, I still believe in you, one of the guys I witnessed to for eight months on the bank of that river, standing over what he thought was my dead body, he gave his heart to Christ. If I had died that day, which it took 34 years to correct the fact that they thought I did, but they were listing me KIA because for once they had a body, I want to tell you that day, if I had died, there was another man left to carry on. You just can't beat the plan of God. It's so amazing. But now, instead of just one to carry on, there were two of us. Myself and him. And it went all the way through the chain of command to the Pentagon that I was killed in action. But the helicopter landed to pick me up. And I'd swam across that river. And I'm going to tell you, when I did these fingers, these three fingers and a thumb, not my index finger, but these three were, were hanging by skin. And I was pumping blood out of an open artery in my wrist where the bullet went through. And with, I looked down, I could see my heart beating. And when I looked down, every time my heart beat, I'd shoot blood out about five or six feet in front of me. And sit, I'm bleeding out, or I could burn to death or drown. I had the options or none of the above. I chose none of the above because God had a plan. I don't bank the river. I'm looking at this damage, and the phosphorus was so hot that where, from my waist up, my skin came off. Almost 50% of my skin was blown or burned off my body. 60 pounds of flesh in seconds was gone. I weighed 190 pounds that morning. I weighed 130 pounds that afternoon when they put me on a bed and measured and took away the weight of the bed. I lost 60 pounds of flesh that fast, and yet I kept both legs and both arms. So this was a serious like injury because they told my family I would not live. Anything over 30%, third degree was considered fatal and no, there are no exceptions. And I looked down and I saw the damage and that phosphorus was in that hole that bullet went through. And I looked down and it was boiling in that hole, it was boiling my blood and it cauterized that artery. And the thing that was about to kill me now is saving my life. You know, the devil took his best shot that day. He lowered the boom and he fired. And I won't admit he hit me, but I want to tell you something. I'm still here because no weapon formed against me can prosper. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. 
We're more than conquerors through Christ who strengthens us. Amen? So that day, the devil's wasting his time. And the grenade blew, and I went blind in my eye. I went deaf in my ear. It's plastic. It fell off, and I was preaching in Jamaica. It did. I didn't know it fell off. It's like a wet band-aid. It just fell off. I knew something was wrong. Everybody out there was going, <gasps> thousands of people covering their mouth, wide-eyed, not breathing. I thought, good Lord. I checked my fly. <laughs> man's got to do what a man's got. It's fine. What's going on here? I look around. I see my ear laying on my shoulder. I picked it up, dried the sweat, and stuck it back on. It got worse. They thought it was a miracle, and they all got saved. That's a true story. I couldn't tell them it's not a miracle. It's a phony ear. They would have thought I was a phony preacher and would have stoned me. I didn't want to tell you I went to Jamaica and got stoned. <laughs> this doesn't sound right, does it? You're sitting there saying, how, how do you laugh about that stuff? Would crying grow me a new ear? Would crying take away all these scars? Would crying make these fingers straighten out that they got back on but just don't work? Would, cry, would blaming God, would shaking my fist to go, would, would all these negatives that we could have done when things went wrong in our lives? You see, I knew God didn't do it to me. So it never entered my mind to blame him. But I looked at every turn of the road for him to do the miracles that would be required to keep me alive. And he did exactly that, but he just never took the scars away. And on my operation number 50, which was three and a half years ago, and I mentioned I got my nose, my eyelids, my lips. It's a lot better. I don't scare children like I used to. Now it's intentional. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I went into private aviation 40, about 47, 48 years ago, bought my first airplane because I didn't want to. When I walked in the airports, children would scream. They'd hide behind mama's skirt. Mommy, what is it? I didn't like that. I didn't like frightening those kids. Mommy didn't like it. Only thing good out of that was she said, if you don't drink your milk, you're going to look like that guy. But that day, my life took a huge change. And when I was on my knees looking at the damage, I fell over backwards. And they thought I died. But I was tired, you know, swimming, burning. <laughs> The helicopter landed, picked me up. They rolled me on the stretcher, thinking I'm dead, face down, arms hanging off. And now all my chest and all that I could see is still burning. It caught the stretcher on fire. It ripped open, and I fell right through on my head. You ever have one of those days? <laughs> and they rolled me up in wet blankets. They dipped in that river, and that river was a sewer. I'm not kidding. It was filled with every disease known to man, I'm sure. They rolled me up in a wet blanket of that water. And that's the water I jumped into when I was burned. Did you know I was in the hospital a year and two months and never had one infection? And infection is what kills burn patients if they survive the fire and the smoke. Infection, kidney failure, trying to cleanse your blood from gangrene. You'll die. Not one infection the entire time I was in that hospital. Not one. The blood of Jesus cleanses. But that day, they rolled me up in a wet blanket, got me on another stretcher in the helicopter. Away we go. Have you heard me talk about pain? No. Nope. Because from the moment of the explosion until I am in the helicopter and with my knowledge in aviation, I think I can say comfortably we were probably about 1,500 foot elevation off that riverbank, which was only a few inches above sea level. When we took off, the pain hit me, and I... I really don't care to talk about it too much because I can't remember it, and I don't want to kick that sleeping dog. You know what I mean? That little sucker will bite you. And so I don't talk about the fact that I didn't have any pain. I just had none. And when it hit, it went from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. It just was waves of, go of horror. And I let out a yell under the blanket. I said, medic! And I lost most of the air through a hole in my chest that burned right below my vocal cords, but I was breathing through that hole. And a lot of my air went out, but I was able to squeak out the word medic. And when I did, he who thought I was dead almost died. <laughs> he almost jumped out of that helicopter. And the pilot, trying to calm him down, lost control. We're dropping like a rock. And I thought, oh, Lord, we're going to crash, and I'll be the only survivor. <laughs> they got me to Saigon and then to Japan, where I really stupidly asked for a mirror, and they really stupidly brought it. 
and I looked up in that glass with my good eye, and what I saw was this. Everything covered by my hand was second-degree burn. Everything not covered was to the bone. This had enough tiny particles of skin left that it would, what's called granulate, it would grow back in really, very, very slowly. Over here, there was nothing left to grow back. So they had to graft everything around my body, off my legs, which were not burnt. They even offered to make a, a graft from my face, from my lower extremities, and <clears throat> I declined the offer. <laughs> they said, why? I said, because you, people won't know if I'm coming or going. <laughs> so I'm glad to tell you that my face came off my legs. Uh, that, that day on the bank of that river, in that helicopter, these moments were the most drastic changes since I found out I wasn't a Mexican. You can think back of what I'm telling you. If you look close, you see the fingerprints of God on my life from my earliest childhood. No different than you. The secret in life is finding the plan of God for your life and then looking back, not in retrogressing and remembering the negatives, but looking back and seeing the amazing hand of God throughout your lifetime. It's there. And they got me to Saigon, did emergency surgery, and then to Japan. I want to be thoughtful of your time here, so I don't want to keep you too long. But they got me to America. In Japan, I asked for a mirror, and they brought it, and I saw what was left, and that's when people say, that day on the riverbank was the worst day of your life. Not really. I didn't try to kill myself that day. I, I, I did what I could to stay alive. But when I saw myself in the mirror in Japan, I knew that I broke that promise. I'll be back without a scar. And she was such a beautiful girl, and I, I could not imagine her still loving me. And I knew that she would leave me. And I didn't want her to feel bad about it, but I didn't want her to see me. I didn't want her to open my casket to the monster I saw in that mirror that day. And when they walked away from the mirror, they took my hope with them. It was the first time in my entire life I've ever been without hope. And hope is the last line of defense against suicide. And that line of defense was gone, and I tried to kill myself. I didn't want her to see me. I knew they wouldn't open the casket. They were going to send her over to escort me home. I took that, I took that away from them. The doctors were trying to save my life. God was with me. I never turned my back on Jesus, but I turned my back on myself. I didn't want to live. In fact, the war had gotten so bad in my heart that the body, each body count took a little more, robbed me a little bit more of my soul until I felt like I had no soul left. And it hurt to look in that mirror and know that this is the way it would be. She couldn't let me, so I... I didn't have a gun or knife. I just pulled the tube out, laid my head back, and waited to die. <laughs> I got hungry. <laughs> Don't get hungry when you're killing yourself. <laughs> Somehow that insinuates you want to live, so let's eat. I pulled the wrong tube. <laughs> pulled out lunch. That wasn't my life dripping on the floor. That was my lunch. They chewed me out like I'd never been chewed out. They used words I don't even know where they came from. And they told me, that for punishment, they're going to send me home right then. They bottled me up the best they could, put me on an airplane, sent me to America to Brook Army Medical Center, and put me in a room with 12 others. They called us the Baker's Dozen, 13 of us, all burned. They put us in a separate room called the ICU, and I didn't know what that meant until they gave me the little robe that doesn't come together. <laughs> I see you. I saw me. <laughs> I like that. So I walked backwards there where I went. I actually, I couldn't even walk at that time. But it was, it was quite an experience. They, they took me by helicopter from the big airplane that landed at Lackland. They t flew me over to Brook Army Medical Center where I'm a patient today following now 60 surgeries. The last one was uh, at, the at the very beginning of covid they tried to rebuild my hand. They tried to straighten out these fingers. They actually, when they 
gave me a percentage of disability. Every finger had its own percentage. This thumb, which is useless, percentage. This thumb, which was gone, they made that out of my hip. I don't suck my hip, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Hurt your neck. Uh, <laughs> they made me a thumb, but, and then eyelids gone, lips gone, hair gone, and then they tape measured square inches of scar tissue, normal skin gone. When they added up all the disabilities, I was 240% disabled. <laughs> I'm here today almost twice and a half not. <laughs> but they only pay you for 100%. I don't, where, what's the problem with these people? And I remember them telling me, you're unemployable. So you're 100% permanent and total and unemployable for the rest of your life. Well, these fingers don't work, but watch this. It's a mic stand. And look here. A preaching finger. <laughs> Repent. I got a job. I got a job. I'm employed. You see, when you follow Christ, you've got a mission in life, a purpose to get out of bed, and a passion to drive you. You see, people settle for purpose, purpose driven life, purpose driven church. You know, purpose-driven car for all I care. If you are only getting out of bed on purpose, you can go to work at McDonald's. But if you get out of bed with purpose being driven by passion, you own the McDonald's. You see what I'm saying? And I'm passion-driven. And I never once thought I was disabled. Not in, the, not in the slightest. So, I can do just about everything I want to, but it just takes me longer. And... That day, they put me in a tank. When they flew me over to Brook, they put me in a tank of water called the Hubble tank. If you've been burned, you know the word I'm about to use. It's called debridement. And that's when they put you in this tank, they splash water on you, and they soften up the charcoal that was once your pliable skin. And then they start breaking it off and hack sawing and cutting. I can't go too far. You saw me had to throw up. It was horrible. I went out of my mind. And they can't put you to sleep because they have to do this every day, wait, day after after day, until they get that dead skin off or you die of infection. And they can't give you enough drugs to not feel it. Then you become an addict, and that can kill you. So you're caught between the proverbial rock and a hard spot, and they're, they're filleting me, and I just went nuts. The back of my heels and back of my head was all that was touching that tank, and I reached up, and I grabbed one of those nurses by the hair of her head and I flipped her clear into that tank with me and I had her head down in the water. I was still extremely strong. I had, my muscles had not even begun to atrophy. And the stone was gone, but these fingers, other than loss of fingerprints, they were undamaged. I had her in that water. Now, she was never at risk because there were five of us, three on each side, six, and I had one of them in the tank. Five pulled her out before she even was at risk in the slightest way, but when they pulled her out, I looked up. Her hair was filled with my skin. Her uniform was pink with my diluted blood. Oh, God help me. I saw what I'd done, and it just took, took my breath away. I didn't know what to say. They said it for me. They said, I think he's had enough. I spoke and I said, I think he has too. And they put me up on a stretcher and they were pushing me down to that ICU room and on the way the medic said, and he shouldn't have said it, but he did. In the morning at 8.30, I'll be back to get you. We're going to do this again. I looked up at him off that stretcher. I said, not you. Not the entire United States Army is big enough to put me in that tank again. You're never going to do that to me again. You'll never hurt me like that. Ever again. He said, then you'll die. Well, that, that little Gurney had a wobbly wheel that was rattling, kind of like a Walmart shopping cart, you know. And that thing was making me mad. And he said that, and I didn't want to hear that either. I said, well, let's, let's compromise. Let's work out a deal. And he said, what do you mean? I said, well, if you're going to do this to me again, don't tell me. Surprise me. <laughs> he said, what? I said, well, I didn't know you were going to do it to me this morning. You wouldn't have done it because I wouldn't have let you. So if you don't tell me, then you could do it because it's a surprise. I didn't know it was coming. 
He said, are you nuts? I said, no. He said, well, what's the difference? I said, I'll tell you the difference. Now I'm going to lay awake all night knowing that 8.30 in the morning, hell's coming on a blue draped gurney and you're going to put me back in that tank and you're going to hurt me again. I said, I'll go through every form of anxiety attack that there is until you put me to sleep. I said, I can't, I can't deal with it. Just too much pain. He said, okay, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll take care of it. So they got me up there and got me in my bed. Next morning at 8.30, I heard that wobbly wheel coming down that corridor. I'd been awake all night, and everything I said was true. Anxiety upon anxiety. I knew they'd start that filleting, skinning me, and they pushed the gurney up beside my bed, but they forgot to lock the wheels. And one on each end of a blue sheet, two on each end. One, two, three, and when they swung me over to put me on the gurney, the guys on the foot end dropped me. And I landed right between the bed and the gurney, and... I threw out my arms, my elbows like this. And when I did, I was able to hold the head in together for a minute and it separated like that. And my feet went through and my body went down at a 45 degree. And when I, my legs hit, it put a jar of pain through my body. It was all I could do not to just scream. And I felt the bed slipping away as I was falling through the cracks of the bed. And my life would take another change. A man stepped up about six foot seven, 350 pounds and nothing but body muscle, no fat anywhere. When he moved, cannonballs popped up on his chest and on his arms and on his shoulders. And it was just amazing. He was bald, he was black, and his name was Rosie. <laughs> As God's my witness, I'm not exaggerating a word. His name was Rosie, spelled on his arm right there with a tattoo, R-O-S-A. And he put an arm under the back of my head and I stiffened my neck before I would have fallen through the rest of it. And then he reached down with another forklift of an arm and picked my whole body up, which at that time now was down to almost 100 pounds. And he held me like a featherweight. And he didn't turn and put me on a gurney. He walked the entire corridor carrying me down to the place we nicknamed hell from the place we called death row, the ICU. And as he walked, I, I knew... This, this, there's something different here. Why didn't he put me on the gurney? Why, why is he carrying me? Got me down there, put me in the tank of water, and when I was buoyed, he pulled his arms out without touching my raw flesh. He folded his arms and backstepped against the wall. In the morning sun rising in San Antonio, that morning shined through the window, and while they're ripping and tearing and cutting skin and driving me crazy, I looked over and on that beautiful ebony skin were little streaks of fire, tears reflecting that golden rise of the sun, splashing on his folded arms and his lips were moving like he was praying for me. When I realized somebody is in this debridement room praying for me, hope, hope was being restored. Hope was coming back. And when I had all I could take, they said, Rosie, and he reached down in that filthy water and picked me up, pulled me against that giant chest, and they wiped my body off in his arms, and he turned, and again, no gurney for Rosie. And I have to stand to illustrate this. As he carried me, I was draped over his arms. He carried me saying these words exactly, and oh, I couldn't count the times from the debridement room all the way back to ICU. This is what he said. You'll be fine, big man. You'll see. You'll be fine. You'll be fine, big man. You'll see. You'll be fine. He said it over and over and over. He got me into my room, pressed against the air mattress and stretched all those arms back out from under me without touching me. Then he turned and he faced me. And a little patch of hair somehow survived back here, just about the size of a quarter. And with a mother's touch, he stroked that hair, looked me in the eyes. I think I saw in his eyes Jupiter, and Venus, and Mars, the sun, the moon, the stars. Who was this man named Rosie? And he said it again. You'll be fine, big man. You'll see, you'll be fine. 
Then he did something I never let a man do. Bent down and kissed my forehead. <laughs> Said it one more time. You'll be fine, big man. And he turned and walked away. For time's sake, a quick forward f- progress to 20 years. Fast forward. The great state of Oregon, Air National Guard, 4th of July. I'm the speaker, 20,000 people. Give me a crowd like that, and I feel like I do this morning talking to you. I loved it. I got through, and everybody's leaving. A lady walks up in a very beautiful, beautiful business-type suit, hair immaculate, little salt pepper. She was older than me by probably 10 years, maybe. And she said, you're Dave? And I'm thinking, yeah, I'm Dave. But then we didn't have big screen TV. And I'm thinking, oh, she's probably at the back of the crowd anyway, so she's just trying to see if I was a speaker. I said, yes, ma'am. She said, but that's your nickname. Well, duh. What is it? My real name, Bartholomew, and they nicknamed me Dave. I said, yes, ma'am. She said, your real name's David. I said, yes. No big deal, I think. Then she said, that's your middle name. You didn't know that, did you? I don't go around telling everybody, oh, my middle name. No, I'm just, I'm just Dave. She said, your first name is Milton. I'm, I'm, I'm stunned. I said, yes, ma'am. She said, you're Milton David Reaver. I said, yes. Who are you? She said, I'm the nurse you pulled into the tank. <laughs> I felt horrible. She said, I thought it was you, but I didn't recognize you with your clothes on. <laughs> Don't go to Sunday school with your doctor. We laughed, and then I remembered Rosie. I said, Madam, do you remember a guy named Rosie? If I thumped her on the head with a two-by-four, she staggered, she blinked like she came out of a trance. She said, I haven't thought of him in years. I said, do you know where he is today? She said, I have no idea. I said, do you know where he came from? Maybe he's, she said, I have no idea. I said, do you remember his real name? She said, all I remember was what was tattooed on his arm. I said, yes. She said, it was Rosie. That's all I ever knew. I said, when did he come to Brook Army Medical Center burn ward? She didn't hesitate a second. She looked around. She said, when you came. I said, when did he leave? She said, when you left. My friends all tell me he was an angel. Probably was, but I hope not, because angels are just on assignment. They do what they're told. No will, no desire to do other. They just do what they're told. But if it's a man, he's a man on a mission. He didn't have to do what he did. But when he picked me up as I was falling through the cracks of life, he gave me hope. He gave me a reason to believe. He carried me where I couldn't go on my own. He brought back that light in a world of darkness that I was staring into until it was staring back into me. And I've never gone back to that darkness again. Rosie carried me that day. You say, well, Brother Dave, what's your point, my point? It's really simple. There are people throughout this community that are terrified of a pandemic. All over the world, people are terrified. They panic in a pandemic. You know what they need? They need you to be a rosy. Just be a rosy to somebody today. Pick somebody up and carry somebody that couldn't get there on their own. Do for them what they can't do for themselves. Love them when they don't love themselves. Encourage them when they can't encourage themselves in the Lord. Be a rosy. For time's sake, I've got to stop. No one told me when I had to quit. I just want to be thoughtful. And so today... When they call me to go to these countries overseas, they don't call me because I'm good looking. I'm better looking, but not good looking. And people tell me all the time, oh, you're looking good, but they never say I'm good looking. (laughs) So I still got a ways to go there. They don't call me because of my mighty military strength. I have to sit down to talk, but they accommodate me with wheelchairs or private transportation wherever I need to go when I'm on contract. And, And they don't call me because of my intellect. I was in the top 10% of the lower one-third of my class. <laughs> I majored in fractions and decided five out of four people don't understand fractions anyway. 
And if you didn't catch that, you were in my class. <laughs> so why am I here? I'm here to be a Rosie. And if my words can encourage you, take these words to heart. Not just to mind, take them to heart. Don't just hear it, listen to it. Listen to the words that we are to comfort with the comfort wherewith we are comforted. Let that soak in. Fourth and fifth verses of the third chapter of 2 Corinthians. Comfort those that are in any trouble with the comfort wherewith we've been comforted. So that's what I came to do today. My job with the military is still very active. In fact, I just scheduled another tour with them, and they don't think I'm old at all. I love that because when you're in Jesus, you never get old. You're timeless. Your body may age. That's the least. Your, your soul and your spirit, if it's born again, never dies. How do you put age on it? So don't get old. I got to quit. I have a little short video I'd like to show you. It's only a few minutes long, but it'll show you what I do as a Rosie. It'll show you the places I go in the military, especially out of Iraq and Afghanistan, which I'm not permitted to, to caption because some of those places are they're still uh, under security. And But if you've been down range, you'll recognize those places. And then you'll see the ranches that I built, one in Colorado and one in South Texas down near San Antonio, both ranches an hour and a half from major military hospitals. And the Department of Defense still sends to me warriors that are struggling, trying to get through their injuries. And you don't know how many are being injured. Even to this day, they don't, it's not in the news. They don't want you to know it. But I'm going to tell you this. Operation Warrior Reconnect that you saw the shirt that represents our program. They still, DOD still sends them to me on active duty because Jesus is our answer. And they just say, keep it under the radar. <laughs> so we do. We don't talk about it a lot. But uh, you'll see that. And then the last thing you'll see on this little video is the most difficult thing I've ever been asked by my country to do. It's not survive Vietnam. It's not going to these war zones and survive some firefights I've been through. I, can't, I don't even carry a weapon, but I have SEAL teams that go with me and protect me. But I've been through four firefights with the enemy overseas in the Middle East. That's, that's not the hardest. You know what the hardest thing is? To sit in a C-130 at about 19 to 21,000 feet, grinding out the hours across the Middle East, and to look at those transfer cases that we call caskets draped in beautiful American flags and wonder which one was the next Billy Graham, which one was the next Mother Teresa, that nurse that was killed in the hospital at a certain place. To sit there and see the price paid for freedom and know that the general public at home would never, ever understand what a warrior does for the cause of freedom to the point that they lay down their life for their brother, the highest form of love you and I will ever know. And it was shown to us through Jesus Christ. I hope this video will touch your heart. It's called The Angel Flight Home.
Prison Tower, good afternoon. Angel Flight Bravo 03. Gear down, five miles. We have a hero on board tonight. Angel Flight Bravo 02, you are number one for landing. Welcome home. With that, I want you to know that there's another angel flight. If you don't have a ticket to fly, you need to get one this morning. There'll be a welcome home one day. We won't be arriving there in a casket. We may have launched from a casket. We won't arrive there in a casket. And when your ticket is punched, you know where you're going. If you don't, I'm going to ask you to follow me in a simple, simple prayer. Here's what I'm going to do. For us that know Christ and are walking with him actively, I'm going to ask you to repeat with me and renew our vows in this very short, simple prayer. But if you're sitting there and you're saying to yourself, I'm not ready for that flight. I'm not ready. I know I'm not living it the way God wants it. You're living in condemnation. Sin rules. Why don't you pray these same words with us as we renew our vows like we're coming to Christ for the first time. The Bible says, return to that first love. Why don't you pray the same prayer with us? Make peace with the Almighty, the Prince of Peace. Are you ready? Let's do that together. And please pray out loud so that others can pray. We confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus. So let's pray out loud. All right, ready? Lord Jesus, I know you're real. I sense your very presence. You're holy. I'm unholy. The contrast is amazing. Please forgive me of my unholiness. Forgive me of all my sins. Make me holy. Cleanse me by your precious blood. You died. You shared your blood because I was supposed to die and shed my blood. But you did that for me because the penalty of sin is death. But you gave me life and I accept it. You are the Son of God. You were born of a virgin. You did die for my sins. You arose again on the third day. And I believe it. And you're coming back for me. And I believe it. Therefore, today, I declare I'm a child of God. Born again. Amen. Go ahead, celebrate. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, that's a reason to celebrate, isn't it? Amen. I know Pastor is, uh, today told me that they would receive any of you that would like to come forward for prayer. Uh, I think if you would like to do that, you're welcome to do that. I, I'm, I'm suggesting that it might be after these closing remarks and your opportunity to give because I don't want your giving to interrupt what might be a length of prayer time. Would that be okay to move forward like that? comfortable with that then here's what I want you to do there you've been graciously uh, I've been given the opportunity to invite you to support what I do I want to tell you this I do not take government contracts I don't take them because when you take money from Uncle Sam he takes freedom away from you and the first freedom that will be taken away is already sitting in the White House I don't care how you voted. That doesn't mean beans to me. But the man in the White House has already got plans to take away your freedom in religion. And you watch. You watch. It's going to happen in his administration. It's going to be taken. And here's the point. I'm not for sale for 30 pieces of silver. So I don't take their money. So they can't come to me and say, give the money back. Now, you could, but I'm not going to do it. <laughs> 
But you saw those ranches we built. We're winding up in the next 14 days all the construction at Eagle Summit Ranch, Texas, the one near the San Antonio Hospitals. It's out near Kerrville and on the way to Junction, Texas. Beautiful. And you can help me finish up. It's a pavilion that's probably 20,000 from being completed, but even more so than that. Two weeks ago, we had every house, every bunk, every cabin, all the rooms in the lodge, Every room and every building, with every bed was filled to the max. And you would not believe the transformation that took place in the lives of those veterans and active duty that were there. That's what I live and breathe for, is to see them have the opportunity to find what I found. And without our ministry doing that for them, the odds are against them. You know how many take their life every day? Twenty-two. Every day, every 65 minutes, a military veteran commits suicide. I'm trying to catch 22. And I'm asking you, help me catch them. It costs me $2,000 per warrior. We fly them in. We pay for a round-trip airline. They don't spend a penny. If they came with a nickel, they go home with a nickel. They do not spend one penny. But I pay $2,000 per warrior. And I've got 24 of them coming in in three weeks to the ranch in Colorado. These are married couples, and I want you to know we're saving thousands of lives of marriages in the lives of these warriors that come. Mama comes with Daddy. And then during the summer, we put together a huge family camp, and all the babies come. Everything's covered. Family camp cost me $100,000 for five days. I need your help, but especially for what's coming up in two ways. One, help me finish the pavilion, and the other is, I got to put together scholarship money because this last one took everything we had left. So with your support, we need, and if that offends you that I asked for your support, I, I didn't preliminary this way. I needed to say, it. if you get offended easily, I wasn't talking to you. <laughs> so you're, you're excluded from the conversation. That way you can't be offended. So that's, that's a fail safe. But if you're not offended, that I ask you to share some responsibility with me to step up to people who've given an arm and a leg, and I'm not going to ask them for more. They've given all they could give. And it's my joy to give them the week of a lifetime. And they keep coming over the years. They return until we have produced disciples that go out and disciple disciples. And our military is impacted in the most powerful way through this ministry called Operation Warrior Reconnect. If you can give a gift of $1,000 up to 100,000, don't let that frighten you. There are people that can do that kind of thing. In Texas, in Fort Worth, have you ever heard of Al Banker Insurance? 1-800-THANKS-AL, I don't know if you get it out here. He's the largest independent agency in the state, probably in America. He's extremely wealthy. He matches every $1,000 gift to the 100,000, and he's done the 100,000 nine times. He's coming up on a million dollars just in matching funds. But he matches $1,000 gifts every first Monday of every month. So if you can make a gift of $1,000, you're welcome to do that on the credit card when you purchase some of our materials. We'll give you an exact amount of any contribution so that nothing goes out of this church you're not aware of. I am more than happy to be totally transparent because Dave can't do this on his own. But with your help, we can do the unbelievable in the lives of those who've given so much. So if you give $1,000 on your credit card, uh, or your neighbor's credit card. I don't know which one you buy. <laughs> Give 10000 on your neighbor's. <laughs> and if he's really rich, go for the gold, 100 But uh, when you give today, you'll know why. Because this man loves God. He loves the church. He's my Southern Baptist buddy and his wife's Pentecostal, and they still live together after 40-something years. That's amazing. The most lovely couple you ever meet in your life. And he loves God. And he's my sugar daddy. That's what I tell him. He's my sugar daddy. Don't mess with him. Because guys like that, that can take normal people like us and make a huge difference in matching funds. So thanks for letting me mention that. Uh, Pastor will tell you how to make out your check. Thousand is spelled T-H-O. <laughs> and if you don't have anything, don't you know that I know some people can and some can't. That's not the point. We do what we can. And a $5 gift is as much to God as a $500,000 gift. 
if it comes from the best we can give. That's all God. He's not looking for equal giving. He's looking for equal sacrifice. And even not sacrifice, equal mercy. So I've said all I want to say about it. Thank you for letting me mention that. Stop by the table after the service and take some of these materials with them with you. And we always appreciate when you pay for it <laughs> as you take it. Uh, it's been fun to be with you guys. I knew it'd be good. I, if no one else is blessed, I'm blessed to be here today. You got to me today, and I really needed a church like you that not living in fear. Thank you. I'm Dave Reaver, and I approve of this message. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Dave, and I'll help you down. As Brother uh, Dave, he's going to come sit down here. We're going to close a little bit different today, as he said. Me and Brother Trey will be here to the end of the service, but one thing that we do need to do is we're going to take up a love offering at this time, so the men that's going to be partaking up the love offering, if you'd please come, uh, go ahead and come forward, and we'll get the hats out, and we're going to just pass the hat through the house. And uh, Trey, I want you to come on up here, Brother, and I want you to pray over this love offering. But... Brother Dave here was called with a purpose in Vietnam. The true purpose of his life was this, to share Jesus Christ with every wounded warrior that leaves that place. Share the love of Christ with people. So as they come today, I'm going to share, ask Brother Trey to pray over this blessing uh, that's going to be protected. All right, Lord, I thank you for this day, God. I thank you uh, for this man's ministry. God, I thank you that you are using him in such a mighty and powerful way. And Lord, I pray that you would bless him abundantly. God, uh, for, for physically, God, for mentally, God, for, for anybody and everybody that steps onto those ranches, God, I pray uh, that they would feel you the minute they drove through the gate. And Lord, that you would do uh, more and abundantly than what we could do. And Lord, I thank you for who you are. And Lord, I pray uh, that you would bless those who choose to give. God, bless their households abundantly. And Lord, we love you. Amen. It's 
my joy to honor in all I do I honor You are my King, you sweet Jesus, you are my King, Savior, you, yes, you, you are my King, amazing love. You, my King, would die for me. Amazing love, I, I know it's true. It's my joy to honor you in all I do. I honor you, yes, in all I do. I honor you. Thank you all so much today for being patient. Uh, Brother Dave will be back there at his table. Stop by and say hello to him. Uh, just encourage him because he travels a lot. But at this time, we'll close in a word of prayer, and then you all will be dismissed. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day, Lord. We just love you so much, Lord. And we just thank you for sending Dave here today, Father, to share his story, to share your love with us, Father, and the great and mighty things that, he, that you have done through him, Father. Lord, I pray right now for the person today that's, that didn't have hope, that they heard about the hope of Jesus Christ today, that saving grace, and prayed that sinner's prayer. Father, I pray for them. And Lord, I just ask that you'd watch over us and guide us in the days to come. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. There may be a little on what I say, I say I'm wrong. That's not really who I am. Words I write, they have no rhyme When I play, I'm usually out of time That's not really who I am I'm a child of the King I've been washed by the blood No longer the man that I once was When you look at me You may not like what you see I'm a child of the King Sometimes I let my temper Get the best of me I say things I really don't mean I laugh and cut up way too much Sometimes I come across this rough That's not really who I am I'm a child of the King I've been washed by the blood No longer the man that I once was When you look at me You may not like what you see But I'm a child of the King blood no longer the man that I once was when you look at me you may not like what you see 
But I'm a child of the King. Oh, I'm a child of the King. I've been washed by the blood. No longer the man that I once was. When you look at me, you may not like what you see. Oh, but I'm a child of the King.